Let's pray. God, you are indeed holy. And with the angels, we cry out today, Lord, holy, holy, holy. Father, I, I pray that as we study your word today, that we would see you as just who you are, the King of glory. For those who need to have an encounter with Jesus today, Father, I pray that by your spirit, you would lead us to truth. It's in the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. It is so good to see you guys today. I uh, recently read about a fascinating study where researchers literally put a clown on a unicycle in the path of pedestrians, and it looked something like that. Now, here's what they did. They asked people who walked past the clown if they noticed anything unusual. Now, you'd say, how could you miss it, right? Well, they were actually studying people who were on their cell phones. Like, when you're on your cell phone, are you paying attention? When you're driving and you're on your cell phone? Okay, so... Everybody saw the clown. Everybody. But three out of four people who had been talking on their cell phones responded that they didn't see anything abnormal. When informed that there was a clown on a unicycle, they looked back in astonishment, unable to believe that they missed him. Even though they couldn't help but see him, they walked right past him, looked straight at him, but his presence didn't register. The unicycling clown crossed their paths, but never crossed their minds. When I read about that, I wondered how often I miss stuff because I'm distracted. Like whether, whether, in, whether it's moments where we experience something that would make for a great story, like the unexpected appearance of a unicycling clown, for instance, or those moments that offer treasures with family or friends. I I even got to wondering how often I miss meaningful moments with God because of my distraction, knowing that that worries of life and, and even preconceived notions about the way things should work or who God is, they will often blind me and maybe even us to God and his kingdom. The distracted life is the life that's out of touch. Now today's encounter with Jesus introduces us to a man who almost, almost missed his meeting with the king. But he actually powers through his preconceptions and not only met the king, but he learned that God's kingdom is what happens around us when God reaches out of heaven and touches earth, ordering and reordering things to create an atmosphere that reflects his character and an environment that fulfills his desires. Now, it's, the story's told in the first chapter of the book of John. So if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to be in John chapter 1. John here details events where Jesus invites a prospective disciple to follow him. And in the encounter, we actually learn how to see the kingdom. But most importantly, we learn how to enter the kingdom as citizens. So, a question that you should ask yourself today is, am I a citizen of the kingdom of God? Have I come to the place where I know that I've had an encounter with the king and placed my faith and trust in his transforming truth? Now, to set the stage for what we're going to read, understand that Jesus, at this point, is he's really busy establishing his team of disciples. Okay, James and John have signed up. Andrew and Peter have heard the call and signed up. So Jesus is 33% of the way there. He's got a good start, but there's more to come. And so we pick up the action in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43. This is after establishing a relationship with Andrew and Peter. It says, The next day, 
Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And so Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip then, <clears throat> excuse me, Philip then found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You'll see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending, descending on the Son of Man. Father, I pray that as we consider your word today, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful, beautiful, transforming truth. And Lord, as a result of meeting together with you in your spirit, I pray that we would be aligned with your vision for our lives and our world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So Jesus, building his team, okay, he goes to Galilee, where he knew he had an appointment with a couple of prospective recruits. Right? He finds Philip, and Philip immediately jumps on board. He, he, he's all in for the start. Now listen, that's the way it is for some people. Some people just hear the good news of Jesus, and they immediately believe. They, they eliminate all other possibilities, and they commit to following Jesus on the spot. That's the news they've been waiting for. Philip was that kind of guy. As a matter of fact, he was so convinced that Jesus was the one they had been waiting thousands of years for that he wanted to share the good news, and he immediately sought out his friend Nathaniel. But I hope you noticed, we read the text, Nathan's response to the idea of Jesus being king was, shall we say, rudely deceptive. Remember, Nazareth, can anything good come there? You know what, that, that wasn't just skepticism, it was belittling skepticism. But it's informative skepticism, because... It reveals us the biggest obstacles that most of us have to overcome to experience the kingdom of God, to place our faith in King Jesus and to enter his kingdom. What, was the, what are the issues? Pride and prejudice. It was pride and prejudice. All Nathaniel knew about Jesus based on that conversation with Philip was all he needed to know. What, what did he know? He was from Nazareth. And that was a problem. It was enough to rule him out. You say, wait a minute. I, I've, oh, little town of Bethlehem. Isn't Jesus from Bethlehem? How, how could they get that wrong? Well, actually, he was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth. And for Jews, all of them except the Nazarenes who lived in Nazareth, they believed that Nazareth was on the wrong side of the tracks. Okay, everyone rolled their eyes with contempt at the Nazarenes. They were second-class, second-class, second-rate Jews at bet. So naturally, just naturally, Nathaniel and everybody else, but in this case especially Nathaniel, thought himself better than anyone who came from Nazareth. Just by the location of their homes, 
They were second-class citizens. Nathaniel believed he was smarter, more industrious, and certainly closer to God, more spiritually committed than all the Nazarenes put together. So in his mind, there was no way the God of heaven would ever allow anyone from Nazareth to establish his kingdom. No way, because that person was raised in such a backwards place. By the way, can we just stop there for a moment and acknowledge that some people believe that to be true of Christianity? Some people believe that this is a religion of weakness, when in fact it is a relationship with God who gives us strength. Nathaniel thought, as would all the Jews, Nazareth is the last place you would look for a savior, for a king, for anyone to displace the Romans who were occupying Israel. So while he was looking for the king of the Jews, who was a committed Jew, while he was looking for the king, he would never look in Nazareth. So he dismissed the possibility immediately. His pride and his prejudice wouldn't even allow him to consider it. Now, you you, you recognize, I hope, that pride and prejudice keep people from trusting Jesus. I'm prideful about the things I know. I've done the research. I have better ideas. I'm prejudiced against the idea that I can't work my way to heaven, that I have to trust that God sent a son born of a virgin to die on the cross so I could be forgiven of my sins that I'm not even sure I've committed because I'm not as bad as many people. And so because of pride and prejudice, we, we push aside the idea of Christianity. Nathaniel, no chance Jesus could be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He wouldn't consider it. But he, was, he would soon learn what life has taught us over and over again, when you're searching for something, you always find it in the last place you look. Okay, that's a joke. Did y'all get, get that? You always find it in the last place you look. I just couldn't resist that. So after an adamant, eye-rolling, prideful rejection, why would he go with Philip? If all that made it impossible for Jesus to be the Son of God, the King of Kings, if all that made it impossible, then why in the world would he go with Philip? Well, I think Philip was proving to be a friend. That was one reason. And then there are three other reasons I look at, and and while I'll admit we can't be 100% sure, I, I believe there are three factors revealed in this story that caused him to back off of his original position that nothing good could ever come from Nazareth. What are those three reasons? First, Nathaniel was a spiritually minded man. He was sensitive to the things of God, sensitive to the spiritual world. Okay, now as a Jew, there was only one way to demonstrate spirituality. Only one way. They believed in the one true God, and they were committed to God's Word. Okay, they were committed to what was revealed in the law of Moses to the nation of Israel. See, when God established his nation, he gave them the law to help them find and stay on the path of life. He had an agreement with them that if they would follow his word, he would be actively engaged in their protection and their prosperity. So Nathaniel was apparently committed to searching and knowing God's word and to following it wherever it led. Okay, now how do I know that? Well, we could draw that conclusion because when Philip decided to follow Jesus, he immediately thought of Nathaniel as the one who would want to know. So if you have a spiritual experience, then who are you going to share it with? The people who would be most interested, most agreeable to your experience, right? So Philip immediately thought, oh, I've got to go to Nathaniel about this. But even more telling was the way in which Philip approached him. 
Do you remember what he said when he went to find him? Look at verse 45. Philip, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, the one Moses wrote about in the law and the one about whom the prophets also wrote, uh, Jesus of Nazareth and the son of Joseph. Yes, he's from Nazareth, but he was written about in the law. And the prophets were pointing to him. Now, Philip brought him what he believed to be proof of who Jesus was from the Holy Writ, the ancient scriptures. But he didn't have to. He, he could have picked a number of things to try to convince Daniel to come and meet Jesus. He, he could have said, hey, listen, Jesus knows everything. He could have said that Andrew, Simon, James, and John have already signed up, and you like them. They're, they're nice guys. He could have said he gave me peace instantly. Or he could have even said that John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. He could have said any of that stuff, but he didn't. What he said was, This one this carpenter from Nazareth is the one the Scriptures speak of. Now, my conviction is that he led with that because Nathaniel was a supremely spiritual man on a quest for truth who wisely let Scripture guide him. He was a committed Jew. He loved God's Word. And he was going to pursue the truth it revealed. Second, he was a man of integrity. And do, do you remember what Jesus said about Nathaniel when he saw him walk up? Look at verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, Here, truly, is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now what does that mean? Does that mean he never told a little white lie? He was always telling the truth? Now there, there, there's more to it than that. A true Israelite is actually one who is true to the call of God and the laws of God. True to the Word. It, it wasn't enough to know the law and love it, a true Israelite prioritized the law and lived it. It was just part of who they were. It was one in whom there is nothing false would be one who was totally devoted to the most important commandments, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. So whereas Nathaniel had a natural resistance to Jesus of Nazareth being the one that Scripture spoke of, to be true to himself, he had to investigate the claim since Philip told him it lined up with the Scriptures. To be true to himself, he had to explore the claims of Jesus. Why? Because that's what the spiritual person who has integrity does. We don't eliminate the possibility that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life because of our preconceptions because of our pride or our prejudice, we actually explore that truth claim. And when they are confronted, the person with spiritual integrity, when they are confronted with the possibility that Jesus is the King of Kings, they won't let their preconceived notions eliminate that possibility. They will seek the truth. That's the idea. And what Scripture tells us is that if we truly seek, we will truly find. And what the person of integrity recognizes is that to do otherwise would not only be intellectually dishonest, it would be disingenuous and profoundly hypocritical. 
Because if you are on the journey, if you are seeking truth and peace and life, then you must evaluate, consider the truth that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God and the King of Kings. So, Nathaniel, all right, I'll go. I don't think I'm going to find anything here, but my friend is asking me to go, so I'm going to consider it. I'm going to honestly evaluate the situation. So he was spiritually minded. He was a man in whom there was no deceit. He had a great deal of integrity. And the third thing about Nathaniel that caused him to go with Philip is that he was a man in crisis who was looking for answers. He was open to the possibility because he was in crisis. You say, well, how do you know that? We didn't really read that in the story. But do you remember the full conversation he had with Jesus? Look at verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, and here's the key, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, what in the world does that tell us? Fig trees were planted not just for the figs and in hopes of making fig newtons. Did they do that then? But they were planted for shade. Fig trees were planted for shade. And in the heat of the day, nobody stayed inside. They actually went out and found rest and shelter under the fig tree. And it was quite common when someone was facing a crisis that they would go to the fig tree, rest in its shade, and seek God's peace. Now commentators virtually all agree that when Philip went to get Nathaniel, that is exactly what he was doing. He was sitting under the fig tree, wrestling with some sort of crisis, some sort of problem for which he needed God to step in and give him peace. So when Jesus says to him, hey, I saw you there, he was saying more than, hey, I know where you were. I know you were being lazy and taking a break under the fig tree. What he was actually saying was, I know why you were there. I know exactly what is going on in your heart and in your mind. And by the way, God sees you here. And He knows why you're here. He knows exactly what's going on in your heart and mind. He understands your hopes, He understands your fears. And he's brought you here to consider this truth. I know you, he says. I care about you. I am who you seek. So Jesus says, Nathaniel, I know why you were there. I know what you were looking for. And with those words, Nathaniel realized that his prayers had been answered. Whatever it was he was wondering about under that fig tree, whatever he was seeking, he found it that day in Jesus. And he responded with a stunning reversal of conviction. Look at verse 49. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now, while we can't pretend to know everything that Jesus and Nathaniel shared in that moment, we can conclude that whatever it was provided to be enough 
proved to be enough to turn that man's life completely upside down. In that moment when he met Jesus, when he saw him for who he was, he overcame his pride and his prejudice, and he entered the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus right then and there. Now let me ask you a question. Does that mean whatever crisis he was going through was over? No. It just means he was connected to the one who would give him life and hope. He was connected to the one who would be with him wherever he went. He was now connected to his creator, Lord of heaven and earth, King of kings, the Son of God. Right then and there, through his faith in Jesus, his life was turned upside down. He had an experience in the kingdom of God. So his spirituality, his integrity, and in fact his crisis created the perfect conditions not only for him to meet Jesus, but to believe in him as the Son of God and therefore the King of Kings. He was seeking. And every indicator pointed to Jesus as exactly what he was looking for. Now, listen. For Nathaniel... It couldn't have been anything other than an emotional experience. Can you imagine? Walk up to a guy who says, not only do I know where you were, but I know what you were thinking. The, the man, the son of God, that you've been looking for your whole life, Nathaniel literally had an emotional experience with the king and his kingdom. But I want you to notice what Jesus does next in this encounter with Nathaniel. He didn't want Nathaniel to think that this is all there was to it. That, that a relationship with the king of kings is all about an emotional journey. Because it's not. Emotions can betray. There is so much more to experiencing God than an emotional encounter with Christ. That doesn't mean you won't have them or that it doesn't even start that way because it certainly started that way for Nathaniel. So we're not going to discount it. But we need to put it in, in proper perspective. There's more to it. And Jesus informs Nathaniel that there's more. As a matter of fact, he says, hey, Nate, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, he didn't really say that, but that's what Nathan expected because he was from Nazareth. Look what he says in verse 51. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open. Think about this. We sang about it. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, who is Jesus. You will see angels ascending and descending on that ladder, who is the Son of Man. Now, when, when he says that Nathaniel will see the angels, He's referring to that story in the Old Testament that J.P. read earlier today. Do you remember? It's the story of Jacob. He, if, if you don't know that story, it's really fascinating. Jacob was a, he was, he, Jesus would not have said, here's a man in whom there's no deceit. Let's just put it like that. Okay? He was uh, shady, to say the least. And he's on the run because he's stolen his brother's birthright and his blessing. And in the middle of nowhere, as he's running from home to save his own life, he's in a place of utter desolation. And he has to sleep. He's exhausted. So he beds down for the night. 
And the scripture tells us that when he falls asleep, he has a dream wherein he sees a ladder that's stretching from earth up to heaven. And there are angels ascending and descending on that ladder. Now, angels are a sign in Scripture of the royal presence of God. And so when Jacob sees that, he, he says, surely God is in this place. I can't believe it. I've been running. I've made a mess of things, but surely God is right here in this place, even in the wilderness of my sin and in the middle of my crisis, one of his own making. Now, not all crises crises that bring us to Jesus are of our own making, but some of them are. And in the middle of crisis of his own making, he experiences God. There's evidence of his kingdom. Those angels are ascending and descending on that ladder. Now, Jesus refers to that story because he wants Nathaniel and us to know that in the wilderness, in, in the darkness of our sin or the claustrophobia of our compromises, the angels of heaven, even there, can be found ascending and descending on him. Did you notice that when Jesus spoke to Nathaniel, he didn't say, hey, th- th- you, can see, you will see the angels ascending and descending on the ladder. No, he says, you'll see them ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It is through Jesus that the kingdom comes. He is the key. In him, heaven is meeting earth. Through him, God is touching us. He's the ladder between heaven and earth. And the message for Nathaniel and the message for us is that if we will follow him, we'll follow the lead, follow the trail, then not only will we enter the kingdom of God when we place our faith in him, but we will consistently see and experience the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't say, and it'll feel just like it did the first time. He just said, you'll you'll be able to see it because what's going to be happening there is things will be changing. There will be new life. The old will be fading away and the new will be coming. It'll be space where you experience what God desires. It's new and fresh and reviving. And it won't matter the circumstances. The darkness challenges the the storms. You know what won't matter? Because Jesus is the key. If he's there, the kingdom is there. And for those who've placed their faith and trust in him, you know what he said? I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Listen, our our kingdom experience will not be limited to the emotional moment our eyes are opened and our hearts are converted when we meet the king that is a glorious moment and if you have never experienced it then there's no better day than this one to open your heart and mind to the possibility that jesus is who he said he was the way the truth and the life In him we live and move and have our being he is life It's a glorious moment, but it's just the beginning of something incredible where our eyes are opened and not only are we walking with the King, but we're seeing His kingdom unfold in us 
through us and around us in good times and bad. Jesus says He will open up the heavens and God will touch the earth in places and in ways we could never imagine. So where do we experience God's kingdom? Where do we experience those life-transforming God touches? With Jesus. You know, when Jesus was calling the disciples, I think it's in the book of Mark, He says, He called them to be with Him. Later on in the upper room, he said to the disciples, apart from me, you won't be able to do anything. Not like have a bowl of cereal or make a grilled cheese sandwich. Not like that. But anything that makes a difference. Anything that ushers the new in displacing the old. Anything that facilitates the coming of the kingdom of God. Apart from Jesus, you can't do it. Nathaniel first had to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. Then he had to follow him. And in following him with Jesus, Nathaniel learned that you experience the kingdom of God when you least expect it. He found it in a place, in a man from a place that he least expected, and then he experienced it when he least expected it. Where do we have those experiences? Wherever we're connected with Jesus. Could be in a prayer closet or under a fig tree. In an AA meeting, or a hospital room, in a church small group, when dining with family or alone. It could be in a disagreement with a friend or having a laugh with a friend. It could be in the wilderness of your own choosing or when life has just simply given you lemons. It could be in a sleepless night or during a nap, when you're driving your kids or when your kids are driving you crazy. Here's what we know. His kingdom is, indistingu is as indistinguishable as we make it. But it's also as distinguishable as a clown on a unicycle. But it pops up when we least expect it. It's happening around us. And it can be happening in us and through us if we're following Jesus. If we're with Him, we experience the treasure of His presence. It starts with seeking Him. finishes by staying with Him. Jesus knows where you are and why you're there. He wants to join you. You just have to open your heart, open your mind, and trust Him. Let's bow our heads and pray. First, I, I think in these times when we choose to be still before God, it's important to... Um, the Scripture talks about confession. Confession is just acknowledging truth. We're acknowledging truth with God. And so I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge before God that... Uh, 
we have a tendency to default toward pride and prejudice in our dealings with Him. We're prideful about positions we've taken, things we know. We're prejudiced against God and His kingdom because we don't, we don't like the way others have managed it. We have a problem with some Christians, and so we're prejudiced against it. Let's just, let's just confess that reality. Just in your heart as you pray. Let's also confess that pride and prejudice can be an impediment to meeting with Jesus. And yet here you are through friends, through crisis, because you're intellectually curious or because you're spiritually minded, here you are. And the Scripture tells us that when we hear truth about Jesus, He's meeting with us. He's meeting with you. I wonder if you would open your heart and mind to the possibility that He is who He said He was the way, the truth, and the life. Father, I, I pray that today we would recognize that life-transforming truth. That you see us, you know us, you love us. You created us to be connected with you. In you we live and move and have our being. Lord, if there are those in this room who don't have faith in you, I pray today by the power of your spirit that you would release them from the pride and prejudice that holds them back and let them step into the life transforming forgiveness, grace, love, and mercy that you offer in Jesus Christ. Father, for those who are struggling today and in crisis, I pray that you would meet them where they are and lead them to where you want them to be. Lord, we thank you for meeting with us today. May we pursue your presence in celebration of the fact that you will never leave us or forsake us. And Father, we pray that your kingdom will come on earth just as it is in heaven. Amen.